Okay, uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen. It's nice to see uh, a few familiar faces from back through the years. Um, I know I thought some of you before. Actually, I would have expected some of you being able to, to do this class given the, the modules you'd have, you'd have learned here. Um, I, I'm, I won't dare start with a joke. I don't have any economist joke. But I do have a, a request. Just came a text with my daughter. Dad, ask anybody, have they any spare Ed Sheeran tickets? <laughs> so there you go. So who, who's Ed Sheeran? <laughs> okay, um, and thanks, Martin, for the uh, opportunity to, 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 to talk. Um, I, I think th this first chart, um, um, similar to what, what John showed uh, uh, at the very start, gives you some, tells you something about uh, what economists are ex forecasting for different economies. Um, what, what I've shown you up here is the forecast for economic growth for this year, 2017. Uh, and there's a few different bars in there for the different regions. And those bars are when those forecasts were made. So the blue, they were made May 16th, so before the Brexit vote. Um, August 16th would have been after the, the Brexit vote, but before the Trump uh, election. And then November 16th, when, when all the news was in post-Trump and post-Brexit. So those, those are your, 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 your three colored bars. And what John had showed you really was what's on the right-hand side there, Ireland. Uh, and, um, and in a way, what it's, what it's saying is, uh, is quite um, um, positive. It's that the Irish economy is forecast to grow this year at 3.5%. And in fact, the forecasts for the next couple of years are, are about that. So uh, the baseline forecasts are that the Irish economy will continue to grow at a, at a good, decent clip. And as John mentioned, unemployment falling. We'll have full employment by the end of this decade. Uh, so the, the, the baseline forecast, what most economists are, ex are expecting to happen, uh, is, is very positive. Uh, of course, there are, are risks around that, uh, both upside and downside risks, but the baseline looks, looks okay. Um, what I've stuck in here additionally is other countries. Uh, maybe to just start on the left is the UK. The, the UK was forecast to grow about 2% if you go all the way back to before the, the Brexit uh, vote. And when the Brexit vote was taken, everybody said, oh, this is going to be terrible for the UK. So the forecast for this year was slashed down. This is a consensus or an average forecast to about, uh, about half a percent. But then, um, as ink data were coming in for the UK economy, the UK economy was continuing to grow. In particular, consumers were continuing to spend in the UK, so economists upped their forecast again to about 1.4%. 1, and today, Mark Carney, who was the, is the head of the Bank of England, uh, announced the Bank of England's new forecast for this year, and it's 2%. So it's back up to, back up to so they now expect the economy to be growing in the same way that they had expected it to be growing back before, uh, before the, um, um, the vote. So what's going on? How do we think about John? And, uh, how do we think about it? And John laid out some sort of uh, interesting thoughts about um, what's going on in the UK. How come it hasn't fallen off a cliff, given that they've taken this momentous vote? And maybe we could think about, uh, at least what I think about, is uh, Milton Friedman's uh, so-called permanent income hypothesis. And those of you who took a class, I don't think I, I got to this. But, uh, but this is, this is a, 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 a hypothesis that, that people's spending uh, is related to the permanent income. And so I'm giving you this theory because uh, what's keeping the UK economy growing and the reason that they're upping the forecast is that the UK consumer is continuing to spend. Uh, and that's a little perhaps a bit of a puzzle because we, we would have thought that the UK consumer would have said this is a disaster and stopped spending, but they haven't. Uh, so to continue to spend. And so if this is right, then it must be that the UK consumers are still quite optimistic about their permitting. And the permitting is the sort of long-term income. And the idea of this theory is that when we're making expenditure decisions, we don't just think about our, our income today, we think about our income over, the, over our whole lifetime. Then. So if you're a young person and you, think you, you, get, you, have, a, you have a good job and you, you, you're confident that your income is going to rise and you're going to get promotions and stuff, you might spend a bit more today, you might even borrow some money because you're expecting your income to rise over, over your lifetime. So people think about long-term or permanent income. And maybe what's happened in the UK is that, um, well, the UK, most UK citizens, after all, most UK citizens voted for Brexit. So they thought it, it presumably was good for them. And therefore, they thought it was probably positive, or at least wasn't negative for the permanent income. So there hasn't been an adjustment in the UK mindset among citizens about the permanent income. They don't think that this has damaged the permanent income. If they did, then they would be reducing their spending. We may well have seen a recession. Um, so we haven't seen this, this recession yet, uh, but 
if um, Brexit is bad for the long-term income, bad for long-term prospects of the UK, then at some stage UK consumer will ratchet down, they'll cop, out, they'll cop this, they'll see it, and they will then, at that stage, you would expect them to ratchet down their spending. So although we haven't seen the uh, recession that many economists forecast and John touched upon, we haven't seen it yet, it may well be coming. At some stage, the UK consumers will realise, the households will realise that they've done uh, a terrible thing and that has permanently reduced their income and at that stage we'll, we'll see the, the impact. If you look at the euro area forecast, the uh, forecast is um, uh, expected to be about 1.5% of the euro and indeed the, the, late, the very latest data from the euro area look a little bit more positive so the euro area uh, is, supposed to, uh, is expected to grow, nothing to write home about but decent growth. US economy was um, expected to grow back in August before the election, about 1.5%. That has been increased to above 2% now. So, so economists, are sort of in a, at least in the short term, uh, are more optimistic, more optimistic about the prospects for the US economy because of the election of, of Donald Trump, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. So think about Brexit then, how should we in Ireland respond to Brexit? How should the Irish government respond? How should businesses uh, in Ireland respond to Brexit? Um, we all know what Brexit will impl imply. It's going to imply that it's going to be more difficult to do trade in the UK. And I'll show you some, some numbers in that in a few minutes that will sort of quant quantify uh, how, more, how much more difficult it will be. But it's going to be more difficult to do trade in the UK to sell stuff into the UK and to buy stuff from the UK, at least in certain sectors. Well, if that's true, then we're going to have to sell the stuff somewhere else. And that somewhere else is going to have to be in continental Europe. So what Irish businesses are going to have to do, those that sell a lot to the UK, is if they want to keep going, is they're going to have to sell that stuff to France and to Germany and to the, uh, Italy and to the Span Spaniards. Um, in a way, um, you know, we've had, we may, perhaps, although we've been uh, very involved in the European Union, the Euro area and all that sort of stuff, we, in, in one way we sort of had it easy because uh, we were, a lot of businesses had easy markets in the UK that they just continued to sell, for, uh, sell to, uh, particularly of an indigenous industry. It was, it was sort of e much easier to sell into the UK than it was into some of these other countries. But uh, that's going to that's gonna have to change. Uh, Ireland is going to have to win market share in continental Europe. How do businesses do that? I think that's, uh, that's going to be a, a, key, a key question to, to, think, to think, think about, for business to think about and for uh, agencies and the Irish government to think about. Um, well, to sell more stuff to the Italians, what do you do? Well, you, you probably have to be able to speak Italian. It's hard to do business deals if you don't speak the language. So languages are going to be much more important. And we know that uh, Irish, if you look at the data, Irish people, their, their languages, continental languages are not great relative to, to, to other countries. Um, presume, I think there's going to have to be a sea change in, in, uh, in our ability to speak languages. Uh, we're going to have to understand uh, these markets much better than, than, than we did. Um, Trade is going to be affected. Investment is, is, is going to be affected. Um, businesses are going to, and I'll come back to this in a few minutes, but businesses are going to leave the UK, some of them, in order to still be able to trade in, within the EU. And the obvious one that people, talk, uh, people are talking about there is financial services. You can imagine London and other financial services operations in Lon leaving London and going somewhere else. So can Dublin take London's crown as the EU financial capital when the UK is no, no longer in, in the EU. And finally, that's trade, that's investment. The other big economic factor that's going to be affected is labour markets and migration. What will be the effects of increased inward migration into Ireland? Why would we like to see a big ramp up in inward migration? Well, if you think about the UK, in large part the UK vote was about stopping immigrants coming in, in particular from Eastern Europe. Um, so where will, those, uh, where will that mobile labour from, from Eastern Europe go now? Uh, well, a chunk of it uh, will, come, will come here to Ireland, another English-speaking country. So people that would have gone to the UK, the UK is going to presumably shut them out and they're going to they're come here. Uh, we're part of the EU. So are we... Are we, how will that affect us and are we ready to have a significant boost again in immigration from, from Eastern Europe? Those are all questions we should be thinking about. I, I talked about the trade and what might happen to trade uh, with the UK. 
Um, we don't know what sort of deals are going to be done, but here's a, maybe a good way at the moment to think about it. Assume that when the divorce is done, that when the UK leaves the EU in two years' time, in March 2019, uh, that um, we will, um, res we, the, the trading arrangement will be the so-called WTO, most favoured nation scenario. In other words, they won't have enough time to do some sort of bilateral deal between the EU and the UK. And so, since the UK is in the WTO, or at least um, um, in, 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 will be in, in the WTO, uh, what, what we'll revert to is, as a default position is the WTO scenario. Well, um, th that could be helpful because um, if you're a business and you're trading with the UK, you can look up what the WTO tariffs are at the moment. And that might, if this is where we're going to end up, and my guess is this is, is where we're going to end up, then you can see what the barriers to trade with the UK are going to be from April 2019 on. The WTO tariffs range from about 0% to about 80% uh, across more than, than uh, 5,000 products. So the tariffs are taxes, import taxes that are put on on to trade in these goods. And they're done by, by categories and subcategories and it gets, very, it gets very detailed. And you can go on the website and bang in whatever product you, 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 you like uh, and it'll tell you what the tariffs are, are going to be. They can be ad valorem, uh, so per value, or they can be per weight, or per unit or per weight, and some of them are, are, uh, are, are mixed. Um, the WTO allows um, countries to submit both a minimum and a maximum, uh, so you have a min-max range for, for every um, for every product. Let me show you a, a few of them then. Um, so this is uh, potentially, uh, I think of as the default position, what a tariffs will face um, exports from Ireland into the UK in two years time or um, imports of these goods from the UK into Ireland. That's going to be very difficult for you guys to see but I'll, 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 I'll call out a few of them. So what, what you have here is that the tariff rates they're at the bottom, uh, you can't see them. They go from 0% all the way to 45%. That's the 45% out there. Okay, um, that's 10%. So the thing to notice is that there are a few products where these blue lines uh, go way out here to the 45, uh, to around 50%. Those are products or categories of goods that get hit with really hard tariffs, very high tariffs. So those are meat, sugar, confectionery, processed meat and food, flowers, animal feed, edible stuff. You get the idea. This is agri-food. So agri-food and agriculture faces very high tariffs. And what's happened is um, the WTO was, was, was uh, um, 100 and whatever, 80 countries that have trade agreements. But of course countries like to protect their farmers and their agri-food. Uh, and so they have agreed to put very high tariffs onto, onto agriculture. So agriculture and agri-food, very high tariffs. Um, so that's um, important for Ireland because of course, as John mentioned, a big chunk of Ireland's agri-food and agriculture is sold to the UK and in two years time there could be a 50% tariff on a lot of that stuff. Uh, that's going to be devastation for a lot of agri-food and agricultural exporters. Um, and if you look at areas in the country that, that, that depend hugely on agriculture and agri-food, you can see it in maps like this around the Golden Vale, that area, up around Monaghan, I think a lot of that has poultry and stuff like that. But there are part, parts of the country that are extremely dependent on agri-food. Uh, and they face, unless something extraordinary happens in terms of a quick deal in agriculture, they fe face extremely high trade barriers. Um, it's also true, by the way, of people importing this stuff from the UK because it works both ways. So if you're an importer and you're importing food products, all this sort of stuff, then the ta from the UK, then the tariffs can be extremely high. And because we go into our shops, a lot of the stuff that we buy in our shops come from UK, UK retailers, the UK agri-food products, and potentially could be hit with extremely high tariffs, pushing up prices of all the stuff that we buy. Uh, in the, around the middle then you have um, other sort of stuff like um, um, textiles and stuff like that. And when, when you get into the small numbers, that's the stuff like um, electronics and medical devices and all that sort of stuff. Those are tariffs of 1 and 2 percent. A lot of the industry, uh, you guys are involved in, I think, a lot of the industry around, around Galway uh, would be in products that have none or trivial amounts of tariffs under WTO. So the important point is, it, it, 
it, it, if this way it ends up, it's going to have very little effect potentially on lots of businesses and sectors because very tariffs, but devastating effect on other others. And so it's a very diverse, uh, very uh, potentially a very diverse story. That's a, a graph that's showing you for different countries um, what the average tariff if you if you, if you um, aggregate across or average across all the different products they sell uh, to the UK and it turns out with Ireland that the average rate would be about 12% uh, and that's high relative to, to many other countries because we um, a bigger proportion of our exports are agriculture and agri-food than most other countries and those get hit with higher um, so potentially um, a, um, a big increase in, um, in, in tariffs um, one other thing also worth thinking about is that at the moment our agricultural exports to the UK are protected by the EU trade barriers. Um, so the UK um, could import a whole lot of stuff from outside the EU, Argentinian beef and, or uh, lamb from, from Brazil and these places, but it's all subject to tariffs and therefore it makes, allow, allows Ireland, Irish exporters of this agri-food stuff into the UK to ch be able to charge higher prices. When the UK leaves, the protection goes away, and so have, you could potentially have very cheap imports of food into the UK, and again, adding to the difficulty of, of, Irish, of Irish exporters into the UK. Um, as I mentioned, uh, what, what businesses will have to do, particularly ag agri-food, is just sell more stuff into the, the EU that's remind, uh, that remains. How do you do that? Uh, well, one potential way to do it is just sell it at, is to cut the price and sell it at, at lower prices, demand curves slope downwards. Um, and so uh, what we might see is that yeah, we keep producing stuff, but it's just sold at much lower, lower prices. Uh, it's also worth remembering that um, we import a lot of stuff from the UK. In fact, the value of imports from the UK is the same as from the remainder of the EU put together. We're a big importer from the UK. Uh, and as I mentioned, those could become a lot more expensive. Let's trade, let's think about foreign direct investment. Um, what we know is that the business models of firms locating in the UK that are selling into the UK are going to be greatly affected because they will face, uh, depending on the sectors they're in, they will face uh, potentially large barriers. Um, so Ireland may become um, the new post-Brexit hub for at least some financial service providers. Uh, we know that there's about 150 financial service type firms from London have visited Dublin and made inquiries at the central bank and, and chat around about, what we, about setting up uh, in, in this country. Uh, they're just inquiries at this stage, but quite a lot of maybe half of them have followed up with other sorts of discussions. So it looks to me, uh, it's hard, very early to tell, but it does look that Ireland will receive a significant amount of financial, uh, financial services activity from, from London. I mean, we could be talking about um, 10,000 new jobs in financial services in, in Dublin. IFSC is at the moment about, I think, about 40,000 employees. So, you know, you talk about that at least increasing by a quarter. So it could be a significant positive shock, uh, at least economically, to, uh, to Dublin. Uh, one issue is can Dublin cope with it? Are there enough offices down there in the, in the, in the IFSC? I think there are if you look down along the docks. Uh, there's room for them to build, but, uh, uh, but it's going to get pretty congested down there. Are, where are they all going to live? Um, 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 but, um, so that's, there's, there's a real issue of, of, of congestion there. Uh, but it does, look like, uh, uh, um, it does look like a significant amount of financial services companies setting up uh, and creating a lot of jobs in, in all sorts of financial services uh, type, types of activity. Um, there's going to be, I think, a big shortages of people in, in working in that, in, uh, with, with those sort of skills. The UK may aggressively lower the corporation tax, um, and that's uh, that, that will have some implications for Ireland. Although, um, if you look at sort of the numbers that people have crunched, the UK lo lowering the corporation tax probably won't have that much damage by itself in the Irish economy. But if the rest of the EU were, were to res retaliate to that, and everybody were to lower their corporation tax down to Irish rates, for example, then it would have a big impact in Ireland. And it's also we're recalling that some Irish firms uh, that have a heavy exposure to the UK, that sell a lot into the UK, it may make sense for them to actually locate into the EU. If they face those big barriers we, I talked about, why face them? Just move over to there if you can, and, um, and you'll be inside the, the UK then, and you can get around those. So you may see some 
um, businesses relocate part of their operations on, in, into the UK to get around those barriers. What about Mr. Trump? Uh, well, with, when I think about uh, Donald Trump and the economic consequences, um, I, I think of it as sort of a balancing here. There's pros and cons and uh, some positives and, and negatives. As John mentioned, one of his, one of his, his campaign promises, I think one thing we've seen, at least that has dawned on me, is that he, he's going to keep his campaign promises. Uh, um, in this country, we're used to, we're not used to that. Uh, so, but, but he came in and he said, I promised to do X, Y, and Z, and he did it. Uh, and it it's going to be chaotic. He hasn't thought it through that well, I think, some of the things he's done, but he's, he's done them. It's, maybe that's, um, that's a, a, a business person versus a, a, a politician. He's just he's getting on with it. Uh, so he said he would increase infrastructure expenditure, and I have no doubt that he will, and he'll get that. There's huge support for that in Congress. Democrats, Republicans, us, no, that will sail through the House, no problem, the Houses. So uh, that will definitely happen. And John mentioned the sector stagnation, and one of the things that Larry Summers suggested for trying to get us out of that trap was actually increased infrastructure expenditure, uh, trying to sort of give the economy a boost. So uh, that seemed to me quite a, quite a, a positive thing. Uh, US economy is almost at full employment, so it does mean that it, it, it does potentially create uh, risks of short-term overheating, but the, the Fed will respond to that by raising interest rates. So you're gonna see higher interest rates in the, uh, in the US, um, in, in part response to to this increased infrastructure expenditure. He said he, he would reform corporate tax regime, and he will. Um, he talked about cutting corporate tax from 35% to either 20 or 15, something like that, so I presume he'd go ahead and do that. Um, he talked about changing the tax code to incentivize job creation. I don't know how you do that, but he, that's what he promised. Uh, so that should be fun. Uh, and he talked about a repatriation tax holiday, and they, they, they did this before, where they, they looked at the amount of money that U.S. corporations had offshore. I think the estimates are around two to three trillion dollars offshore U.S. corporations have outside of the, U, the, the, UK, the U.S., and they want some of that money to come back into the U.S., and so he talked about some sort of tax holiday, which, as I said, I'm, I'm absolutely sure he would do. Uh, when they did this before in 2004, um, it didn't work in the sense that uh, the hope was that by doing this, the money would come back. And then you think that if the money comes into the US, it, it creates, funds new investment to get new plants and machinery up all over the place. But that, not, that wasn't what happened. Uh, it went back into the US, but it sort of stayed as financial. It was given out in, as equity, uh, in, in, as um, dividend. There was nothing, there was very little real impact on actual business investments. So unless they can do it differently this time, uh, I don't think it had all much that, that much effect on, on, actual, on, on actual investment. Um, the other thing, um, I mean, you, you, to me these things are kind of sound positive. Uh, um, um, the one thing I do worry about a lot is the trade restrictions, and that is if he introduces a lot of this uh, barriers to trade with either Mexico or China or, or EU or all these other countries. That's when it uh, may well get, get very, very negative. Thank you very much.